Good evening, everyone. Glad you guys uh, are joining us. Some of you are joining us through Zoom. Uh, we're also recording the lesson on uh, for later. We're going to post it later on Facebook. And this evening, we're going to finish Chapter 8 and get into Chapter 9. The title of our lesson this evening is called The Appeal of Wisdom. And I want to begin by reading verse 32 of Chapter 8. Now therefore hearken unto me, ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction, and be wise, <clears throat> and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my, the posts of my doors. For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that, that hate me love death. So now wisdom... Well, last week we looked at Wisdom and she has just finished giving us a resume and boy does she have an impressive resume. She has been from everlasting. Her impeccable credentials are now laid out on the table and she is be getting ready to give out her appeal. Uh, she, Wisdom knows what she is talking about. She tells us that there are blessings in keeping her ways and when you examine the ways of Wisdom you will quickly find out that the ways of Wisdom are the ways of God. In Psalm 86, 11, David says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I want to park here for a little bit. See what David says? Unite my heart. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by uniting my heart? Do you know that our heart is capable of having uh, multiple, um, uh, not devotions, but multiple loyalties? Uh, you can your heart can be uh, torn in many different directions. You may have a love, a lust for the things of this world, and you may be a Christian, so your heart will be torn in many different directions. And David is saying, and he's asking, he's pleading with the Lord, please, Lord, unite my heart. That's one of the things of being a young person. Uh, they are young, and, and they have not yet developed the wisdom that comes with age many times. And their heart is torn in many different directions. And as you get older and you live this life, you quickly realize where you're headed. You're headed for the grave. You're, you're going to push daisies one day. And as you get older, that becomes a reality. And you look at future, you look at eternity, and you wonder, I wonder have I done my best, my best for Jesus. Keeps, that's the tune of the older Christian's heart. Now, wisdom's first appeal is, Blessed are those that keep my ways. And then wisdom says, blessed is the man that heareth me. And also wisdom says, whoso findeth me, findeth life. Do those words sound familiar? Do they not sound like the words of Christ? In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. In John eight fifty one, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And in 1 John 5, 12, Jesus says, He that hath a son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Wisdom says, if you have me, you have life. See the similarity of the words there. Uh, wisdom gives two important gifts to those who find her. We may call these gifts invaluable gifts. She gives life and favor from God. We have looked uh, numerous times that wisdom gives life to those who find her. And wisdom also says that those who find her obtain favor from the Lord. Wouldn't you want to obtain favor from the Lord? I know I do. In Psalms chapter 30 verse 5, David says, For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Whose favor? In whose favor is life? Anyone know? It's in God's favor. You obtain the favor of God, you will receive life. And then David says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. You see the connection between favor and life. Sometimes I, when, I, when we study the book of Proverbs, you'll come away thinking that perhaps King Solomon read the book of Psalms before he wrote the book of Proverbs. Because by the time that Solomon sits down to write these Proverbs, David has already passed away. In the New Testament, you will find three individuals that found favor with God. Mary, uh, the reference is in Luke chapter 1, verse 30. Jesus Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and David, Acts chapter 7, 
verse 46. The Old Testament also mentions three individuals by name who found favor with God. And these are Samuel, Job, and David. In 1 Samuel 22, 26, the Bible says in Samuel, the child grew on and was in favor with both the Lord and also with men. Does this sound familiar? Where have you heard this expression before? Uh, he grew in favor with both the Lord and with man. Anyone has a guess who that may be? Christ. Christ. That's right. It's Jesus Christ. In Job chapter 10 verse 12, Job says, Thou hast granted me life and favor. To who is Job talking to? He's talking to God. And Job recognized in his life that he had found favor and life from God. And he says, Thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. Again, you see in Job the connection between life and favor. In Psalms 41.11, the Bible says, By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. This is David. David had uh, some, some defeats in his life, but he was a great military leader. Uh, he fought a lot of wars, a lot of battles, and won them. Single, uh, handedly, he won them handedly. Why? Because he had found favor from God. And anyone can find favor from God. Don't think that favor is limited to these individuals that we had just mentioned by name. You too can find favor from God if you find wisdom. I've said, I just said it moments earlier, I don't know about you, but I want to find favor from God. Would you not want, would you not want to be on God's side? I want to be on God's side. There's, uh, there's another thing. Uh, there's several others who find favor from the Lord. I've said this before and I will repeat it again. Uh, when I was a young man uh, growing up, uh, praying that the Lord would lead me to my the future mate, to my spouse, and I'd be honest with you, I believed that the type of uh, wife God would give me would show me what he thought of me. Where do you get that from? From the Bible. If God gives you a miserable, sorry to say this, uh, if anyone's listening online and that's your case, I feel sorry for you. God has given you a, a contentious wife or a miserable woman. Uh, God must not think much of you. I don't know how else to say it. I want to give you a couple of verses here from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 22 says, For whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Well, you may say this means that anyone who is married, anyone who has a wife has obtained favor from the Lord. But there's another verse we've got to connect it with. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 14, the Bible says, Houses and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a what? A prudent wife is from the Lord. You see, you can only receive a prudent wife from the Lord. Why? Because only God knows what's inside that woman's heart. When you marry a woman, she may look like a nice girl. She may act like a nice girl. She, everybody may think she is a nice girl, but only God knows what's inside her heart. So how are you going to protect yourself from Jezebel coming out uh, two years into your marriage or three years into your marriage or five or ten years into your marriage? You don't know that. Only God knows the person's heart. And then wisdom says in verse 36, He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. You see that? He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. There's only one person you can sin against and it, be, and it affect your soul. Who, who do you suspect that is? Who do you suppose is that one being, that one individual that you can sin against and it will damage your soul for, for eternity? That's God. That person is God. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4 and verse 20 say, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And many people debate the meaning of this, but I understand Old Testament theology, and that means that because the soul was not revived as it is in the New Testament, if you die in your sin, you went straight to hell. If you died in your sin, you went straight to hell. John chapter 3, verse 19, the Bible says, And this is condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. What did men love? Darkness. They hated life. They hated truth. They hated the light. They hated wisdom. The Bible says, If you hate the good, if you hate the light, if you hate righteousness, then you love death. Because why? The wages of sin is what? Death. When we think of death, we often think of physical death and the second death. But have you ever thought about spiritual death? Have you ever considered that it is possible 
for a Christian to hate Christ? Oh, how can you say such things? I'm a born-again believer. I don't hate Christ. Well, uh, I, I beg to differ. If you do not live the life that Christ has died for you to live, then what are you really saying about your Savior who died for you? In John 10, Jesus says, I am come that they might have life. Not only that they might have life, but they might have it more abundantly. And if you do not live in this abundant life that Christ died to have you, then what are you, what are you doing? What kind of life are you living? If you are a born-again Christian and living the, like the world, you are in essence deny, denying the very Lord who saved you. John 14, 24, Jesus says, He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. Can you say that about many Christians today? Do they keep the sayings of Christ? And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Disobedience to Christ is basically a form of hatred. If you're not obeying Christ, then what are you doing? Uh, another form of hatred, I believe, is demonstrated by people's lack of concern for, for what's going on in our world, what's going on in Christianity today. One thing I cannot comprehend is people who, uh, who are in doctrinal error. Look at the modern versions of the things that they have done to our Bible. It grieves my heart, to be honest with you. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Now without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And they changed it into He. Do you know that takes away from the deity of Christ? Let me ask you today. Are you manifest in the flesh? You say, well, I have no idea what you're talking about. If I come and pinch you right now, or punch you, will you feel it? <coughs> of course you will. Then you are manifest in the flesh. You see how important that is? It's not, it's not a miracle for, a, for you to be manifest in the flesh. It is a miracle for God to be manifest in the flesh. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, and changed to morning star or day star? Do you know that this gets me so angry? Sometimes I have to hold back and just smile. Think about that. They took the name of your Lord who died for you, and they ascribe it to Satan. Would that get you angry? Would that get you gold? That would mine. That, you have no idea how angry I get over this verse. Daniel chapter 3.25, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Change to the Son of Gods. A Son of the Gods. Luke 2.33, And Joseph... And his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Changed to the child's father. Who's Christ's father? It's not Joseph. Luke 2, 43. In the end of the verse it says, Joseph and his mother changed to his parents. Do you love wisdom? Do you love Christ? Then what does wisdom tell you and teach you when they attack your Lord? How angry does that get you? An attack on the deity of Christ is too much for me. I cannot handle it, to be honest with you. I can't handle it. It gets me really angry because of the Lord who, who I love, the Lord who loved me so much. Why would I want to besmirch His name and His character and His deity? Why would I want to do that? <coughs> well, you say uh, all Bible versions teach the deity of Christ. Yes, you are correct. They all have verses in there that teach the deity of Christ. But let me ask you this. Why attack it at all? Would you drink a glass of water that has poison in it? Well, it only has one drop of poison. Go ahead, drink it. Go ahead. It's only one drop of poison. 99.9% .9 water. Or 99.9% .9 water. Would you do it? Would you do it? Let me ask you this. Would you do it? No, because, because you have more common sense. Do you? I'm going to get off on this. Because I'm going to keep going and I'm going to get really upset. And I will lose my Christian character. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, you know that that's what happens when you love wisdom. When you love wisdom, you love Christ. And when you love wisdom, you love truth. And when something is not truth, it, it, it inside you, it boils, it angers you. Oh, Christians are not supposed to get angry. Righteous indignation. God, well, God got angry. You're not supposed to get angry without a reason. If you have a cause to be angry, then you can be angry according to the scriptures. I'm angry when I see these people step on the blood of my Lord. I'm angry when they besmirch His name. I'm angry when, when they hate God and they commit all these immoral acts. That should get you angry. 
John 7.35 says, Wisdom is justified of all her children. Uh, wisdom knows those who are her children. Do you have wisdom? Do you hate wisdom? Sorry, I just need to look at my notes here for a minute here. <coughs> then if you hate wisdom, you know what you will do to yourself? You will bring about spiritual death. You will be spiritually dead. You, have, you will have no spiritual power to even move a flea. There are many facets to the Christian life. You have a relationship to your spouse. You have a relationship to your children and parents. Your relationship to God. Your relationship to money. Your relationship with the people of God. Your relationship with the Word of God. All these are dictated with the amount of wisdom and understanding you have. Well, what do you mean? Yeah, I want to give you a few examples this evening. A Christian who does not tithe lacks understanding. Well, you say, uh, tithing is not found in the New Testament. It's a principle. Uh, it's, not a, it's not tied to the Mosaic Law. Tithing was a principle established before the Mosaic Law. Uh, Abraham tithed. Yet we are, we are quick to point out that our faith is after the faith of Abraham. Uh, Jacob tithed. And they tithed before the law. Uh, Christians who listen to worldly music... And I emphasize the word worldly because there is some uh, non-Christian music that I believe is not worldly. Uh, a Christian who does that luck, lacks understanding. Why do you say that? Do, do you not know that there are evil spirits associated with certain types of music? And every time you listen to these types of music, you open yourself up to spir spiritual oppression? Oh, you, you, you lack understanding. That's why you have no idea what I'm talking about. A Christian avoids fellowship with God and his people lacks understanding. Oh, I don't need to go to church. No, but God commands you to. <coughs> what do you do with that? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves. Who, who said that? God did in his word. A Christian who is, an, who is unaware of the Bible version issue lacks understanding. Well, I, I'm comfortable with my version. Is that the one God approved? A Christian who cannot discern that we are in a spiritual battle lacks understanding. You can hide yourself in the sand, but the devil is real. He's going to attack you. He wants to, he wants to neuter you. This is a Christian who has not applied himself to wisdom. In this chapter, wisdom, though, ends on a negative note. Proverbs 8.36 says, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. You know, I, one of the things I struggled with a while was that the fact that you hear all these uh, preachers and they talk about uh, love and all is good and God wants you to be happy and God wants you to have a million dollars and God wants you to have two houses, three cars, four wives, five children, and on and on the list goes, right? Some of you may catch what I'm saying, a little bit of sarcasm, but a bulk of the Bible is negative. It's negative, but... The one who loves holiness, and we'll look at that at the end of our chapter, the one who loves justice, you will receive this rebuke from your Lord with gladness. Proverbs 8.36, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. I believe it is possible for a Christian to be saved and hate the things of God. Why? Because after salvation, you have to put in some effort to maintain your relationship with God. God saves you, and then God, in the beginning, God gives you a lot of grace. But at some point, God, want, God expects you to walk. God expects you to run. God expects you to feed yourself. You know, you, you don't, God does not expect you to remain a, uh, a spiritual baby the rest of your life. And now we're ready to move on to chapter 9. But before we go, uh, are there any questions from anyone? Any comments? I know I've said some things that may rub people the wrong way, but love wisdom and it won't rub you, rub you the wrong way. Okay, do you have any questions regarding the lesson? Yes, sir. So, like, I understand, like, the... Well, I don't know if it's a question. Maybe it's just, like, an observation that I'll make. I just want to know if it's, like, correct. But So we already established that wisdom is personified as Christ. And, like, with this ending here, but he that sinneth against me wrong with his own soul, all that hate me, love that. So in a sense, like, sinning or abstaining from godly wisdom has practical consequences in a, in a believer's life. Yes. But it also Real life consequences. has a spiritual consequence because in this case, we're talking about Christ. Yes. And then soon in this chapter, we'll see that wisdom is personified as the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Yeah.
So uh, we're going to get into that. Good point. Just hang on to that thought. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into that thought. The question was, the wisdom is being personified as Christ. Yes. And when wisdom says, he that sinneth against me, basically wisdom is saying that I am God. See how that works? So now let's go on to chapter 9. We're going to read the first six verses. Wisdom's Feast. Wisdom hath, uh, verse 1, chapter 9, verse 1. Wisdom hath built her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beasts. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She hath sent for her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. You'll see this. Uh, places of the city is very similar to what we studied in chapter 1. Verse 4, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. Uh, where should he turn into the house of wisdom? As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and live, and go in the way of understanding. We now come to a place where wisdom has finished her appeal. She has called out to the people, and she has now opened her house. Remember when we studied chapter 1 and chapter 8, we found that wisdom was calling men. But now here in this chapter, she has prepared a feast. Does this remind you of anything? Matthew chapter 2, verse 4. I'm going to read a couple of verses. And you quickly see the connection here between what wisdom is uh, teaching in chapter 9 of the book of Proverbs. Matthew chapter 22, verse 4 says, Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. You see the similarities there? And all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 17. And he sent his servant. Oh, who did, who did wisdom send? Here he sends a servant. Who does wisdom send out? Her maidens. That's right, her maidens. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. You see the, do you see the similarity in this image here? Uh, Revelation chapter 9, verse 19. Sorry. Chapter 19, verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Wisdom has built her house. And you can be sure that she has built it on a sure foundation. You can be sure that she has built it upon the rock. Matthew 7, 24 says, Therefore, who, who, now do not miss, do not miss the connection here. Matthew 7, 24 says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him, I will like him unto what? A wise man which built his house upon a rock. If you are a wise man, you will build your house upon the rock with a capital R. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. So you can be assured that wisdom built her house on the right foundation. Now here we are told that wisdom has seven pillars. What does seven represent? We know the, in the Bible the number seven is a number of perfection and completion. Eight is a number of new beginnings. And the seven pillars, who do you think are represented by these seven pillars. Why, it's the Holy Spirit. The seven pillars ties wisdom to the Holy Spirit. Well, the seven spirits of God are found in the book of Isaiah. These are not seven distinct spirits, but they are the sevenfold, sevenfold activity of the Holy Spirit. We studied this when we looked at the book of Revelation. In, our in lesson three of our study, the book of Revelation, we dealt with this. I just want to give you the seven spirits of God, as Isaiah tells, tells us. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, the Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. First, you'll find that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord. Then you'll find that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of wisdom. He is also the Spirit of understanding. We, found, we find that wisdom and understanding are often connected together in the Bible. Wisdom and understanding are together 53 times in the Bible. The phrase, wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel, the spirit of strength. Who remembers in a previous lesson that we talked about wisdom? She says, 
she says that she is strength, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. These are the sevenfold manifestations or activities, we may say, of the Holy Spirit. Last week we mentioned that wisdom was associated with Christ. And someone asked the question if wisdom was associated, associated only with Christ. And we gave the answer, not really. It was a yes or no answer. Why? Because in this chapter, what do we see? We see that wisdom is associated with the Holy Spirit. You say, well, can you make this connection with the seven pillars? God does not do anything in the Word through coincidence. Everything He puts in there has a reason. The fact that wisdom has seven pillars, she built her house on seven pillars, I believe it's a reference to the Holy Spirit. And here we see in this chapter that wisdom is, is associated with the Holy Spirit. It's like uh, someone asking you, has, there, has anyone asked you who raised Jesus from the dead? You say, well, uh, it was God, but it was the Father. Well, it was also the Holy Spirit, and it was also God the Son. Where do you get this from? From the Bible. Acts chapter 2 verse 24 says, Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. In Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says this, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Look at Romans 8.11. But, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus, you see that? But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and who dwells in us? Which Spirit dwells in us? <coughs> the Holy Spirit. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. The Spirit of God raised Jesus up. 1 Peter chapter 3, 18. Look what the Bible says. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And look at John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto him, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. You see the Godhead working together and raising Jesus from the dead? So hopefully that helps you understand that many times, uh, when you look at the act of creation, you'll see the, the entire Godhead involved in the act of creation. If you study the new birth, you'll see the entire Godhead involved in the new birth. If you see your sanctification, your maturity as a Christian, you will see the whole Godhead involved in that. And the Bible tells us that in Christ, the, the entirety of the, of the Godhead dwelt in Him. Well, let's go back to, uh, to our text here. And uh, I want to reread the verse from chapter 9. She hath killed her beasts, she hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. Doesn't this sound like a feast? It's like somebody has prepared a banquet for you. And wisdom has done that. Now I'm going to broach a subject here that may make several Christians uncomfortable. Uh, but it doesn't make me uncomfortable because I love the Word of God more than man's convictions or preconceived ideas. Uh, the thing about the Bible is you cannot pick and choose what you believe from the Bible because it doesn't fit your doctrine. You hear a lot of people, they, they pick a topic from the Bible and they preach and they yell and they, they give you the, their point of view with such authority that you may think it comes from the Bible, but it doesn't. It's their own opinion. It's their own belief system. Wisdom has prepared steaks, pot roast, brisket, smoked meat, roasted chicken, deep fried turkey, grits, grilled salmon, a broiled perch, and anything else you could imagine. I'm glad I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian. Doesn't the Bible say she hath killed her beasts? Right? Uh, people said, oh, I don't eat pork. Oh, I don't eat shellfish. Uh, in the Levitical law, it's forbidden. Uh, why do you think God told Peter to get up, kill, and eat? What was Peter's response when the Holy Spirit told him, get up, kill, and eat? That's unclean. That's right. Lord, I haven't eaten anything unclean from my youth up. Why? Because I'm sure in that, in that uh, sheet that came down from heaven were elephants and armadillos and bats and rats and cats. I'm just, I have no idea what kind of animals were on that sheet. But you can imagine, 
But one thing you do know, Peter called them unclean. Peter called them unclean. Maybe there was a, a ham sandwich there that Peter had to eat. I don't know. But uh, I'm glad I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian. Now, on the, other, on the flip side, if you are a vegan or a vegetarian, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. You can't tell someone what to eat and what they cannot eat. We have liberty in Christ. If you don't want to eat Bambi or, uh, or Winnie the Pooh, that's okay. <laughs> Whatever, what's a, what's a bunny rabbit? The Easter bunny, right? Peter rabbit. Peter rabbit. If you don't want to eat Peter rabbit, that's okay. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, you have that liberty in Christ. Now, are you hungry? Wisdom will feed you. I have, I have three growing boys and they're always hungry. I remember uh, back in their age, I was always hungry too. Are you thirsty? And here's where we're going to step on some toes. Wisdom will give you drink. Wisdom will provide you mingled wine. Mingled is another word for mixed. What is this mingled wine? Have you ever thought of that in the Bible? A mingled wine? It is simply wine mixed with water. This is what people in the Bible days used to drink. What is wine in the Bible? Have you ever thought of what is wine in the Bible? It's fermented grape juice with alcohol content. How can you say such a thing? Because it is what it is. Wine can lead to intoxication if consumed in excess. Remember, back in the Bible days, they didn't know anything about water purification, pasteurization, or refrigeration. Uh, uh, have you heard of Louis Pasteur? Or, uh, Louis Pasteur? He invented pasteurization. And you know who pasteurized the grape juice? The first man to pasteurize grape juice was? Jack Welch. Up until then, the people couldn't drink grape juice. Because grape juice doesn't stay grape juice for more than a day or two. It turns into wine rather quickly. What are you talking How could heresy? Heresy. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Alcohol is a water purifier. We'll get, we'll get to you quite. Let me read the uh, clean water was not always available for those people in those days. And when water was available, it was often mixed with, with wine. Yes, you had a question. Was it just that I, I was reading about this today? I was studying about it, so I thought it was appropriate. Like, even as, even as late as like the 17th, 18th century, I was reading how sailors used to drink grog, which was water mixed with rum, like one part rum, four parts water, okay, grog. because cause water would just go bad on the boat, right. so it was mostly used to just keep water from going bad, versus yes. drinking to get drunk. Yes, that's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. So grog was a drink they used to drink in the 17th and 18th century, somebody made a comment, that uh, sailors would drink that because we know water, still water, we know that from science, what happens to still water? It breeds bacteria and parasites. Uh, so they didn't have the technology that we have today. Now, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, that's what I believe the Bible teaches. Uh, and if you have a differing opinion, that's okay. But uh, wine is wine. It's a sim it doesn't get more complicated than that. So, even though wisdom has built her house, she continues her appeal. This time she sends forth her maidens, those who have been raised and taught under her care. And who are the maidens in today's day and age? We are the maidens. We are wisdom's ambassadors. Remember that when the feast was ready, what did the master send out? He sent out his servants. Wisdom sends out her maidens. And what are we doing? We are inviting the lost to the marriage supper of the Lamb, telling them that things are ready. Now, in uh, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 5, is often used by Catholics to show, to tell, point people that the fact, uh, well, they say this, the uh, verse 5 that says, Eat my bread and drink my wine points to the Eucharist. Oh, you see, look, the Eucharist is in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 5. And some evangelicals may see the Lord's Supper here. Uh, but uh, one commentator said, and I agree with him, he said, this is an example of taking the figures from Hebrew poetry and wisdom literature and over-allegorizing them. You can find meaning in almost anything. Uh, some people will find, they'll watch Hollywood movies and they will find Christ in the Hollywood movie. You can find, you can make things up Pretty much anything you want. You, you know, I, I'm not going to get into that because I don't want to chase a rabbit here. Uh, I want to chase a squirrel, but I want to go back to our list. Any questions or comments so far? Okay. Uh, pearls to the swine. Uh, this is a very important passage in uh, chapter 9. I'm going to begin reading verse 7. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. 
Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Do you see what do you see what's going on here? If you if you are wise, if you are just, then when someone rebukes you, when someone teaches you, you will become even more wise, and you will become even more just. Verse ten: The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Verse 11, For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. In, uh, in this passage we just read, there's a principle that is laid out that we also find in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. We covered this in lesson 12, but I want to I want to cover it again. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6 says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. This is the reaction of someone who doesn't want to hear rebuke. This is the reaction of someone who doesn't want to hear the word of God. The Bible says they will trample your words under their feet, and then after they're done trampling your words, what will they do? They will turn on you. Have you ever been attacked for sharing someone the truth? Paul says in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? It tells you, it tells you a lot about a person's character who cannot accept rebuke. A scorner. We, uh, we see the word scorner again in the passage we just read. What is a scorner? A scorner is a person who expresses contempt. That means they do not consider it. Or disdain, they don't want to hear it. So when you try to rebuke a scorner, when you try to correct a scorner, they do not accept it. One of the things, when my, as my children were growing up, one of the things we tried to do is, is help them accept their punishment. You did wrong, you're getting disciplined. And you need to accept your discipline. Don't fight your discipline, because it'll be worse. And we taught them this from, from young children. You have to accept the rebuke. You have to welcome it. A scorner is someone who expresses this kind of attitude uh, during their speech. And scorners often think they know everything. You can't, you can't tell them anything. It's like, uh, you know you're talking to a scorner where you're explaining something to them, and they say, I know, I know. They keep interrupting you, and they say, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. That's a scorner at heart, because they know everything. They cannot be taught. A wicked man is an evil man. It's a man who is disposed to immorality, a sinner. And both these types of people, the scorner and the wicked, hate to be corrected. Have you heard this expression, you can't tell me what to do? Have you heard that? Uh, teenagers often say that. You can't tell me what to do. But the Bible says that when you try to correct these types of people, you are basically wasting your time. Now, when you have children, you have to waste your time. Because it is your responsibility to teach them. They may grow up and not listen to you, but the Bible, the Bible promises us, parents, train up a child that he, in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. But you, you have to do it wisely. Uh, the Bible talks about the nation of Israel being stiff-necked. Uh, they are scorners. Second Chronicles records this tragic uh, tragic outcome of the children of Israel. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 16, the Bible says, But they mocked the messengers of God, and despised his words, and misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. To me, this is a, one of the saddest tales of the history of Israel. And today, what do you see outside in this world? Same thing. They mock the messengers of God. Try to talk to someone about Christ today. You will be ridiculed. One of Christ's biggest complaints toward the Pharisees was they were the children of those who killed the prophets. Look what he tells them in Matthew chapter 23, verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. What a sad testimony. 
Matthew 23, 37, Jesus says to the city of Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, and you would not. You know what this tells me? This tells me that God really, really wanted the children of Israel to receive Christ as their Messiah. You know what God really wants today? He really, really wants lost people to get saved. But they won't. It's not, no, it's not any fault of God. It's not because God has predestined them to hell. It's because they refuse. They refuse. They refuse. Romans 11.3 says, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. And then Christ tells us that they killed the householder's son. They killed the heir. And who was the heir that they killed? Anyone? It was Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 7, 52 says, Which of the prophets have your fathers have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. And this is Stephen's preaching. And how how did they react towards Stephen's preaching? They received it with open arms, right? They stoned him. <coughs> they stoned him. And before they stoned them, listen to what the Holy Spirit says about their, uh, about their reaction. He actually records the, the reaction to Stephen's preaching. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. And that's, I believe, we're getting in the day and age where people will be reacting to the Word of God in such a manner that they will gnash at us with their teeth. But then the Bible gives you the contrast to the wise and just man. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Have you heard of constructive criticism? That's how a wise man reacts to rebuke. He takes it in, and he learns from it. I, I appreciate constructive criticism. If you want to criticize me, I will take it. I will listen to you. I will take your criticism. I will not get angry at you. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. Now, it depends on what you're criticizing me about. If you don't like my tie, then I might get upset. But that's a whole different uh, subject altogether. Uh, remember David? When Nathan the prophet rebuked him, what did David say? I have sinned against the Lord. Remember Peter? When Christ rebuked him, he wept bitterly. Simon the sorcerer, remember him? When Peter rebuked Simon the sorcerer, oh, he's, he repented immediately and says, pray that these things do not fall upon me. He was rebuked by Peter because he thought he wanted to make money through the Holy Spirit. He wanted to pay, and he was a believer. Simon the sorcerer, according to the New Testament, believed in Jesus Christ. But he thought to, he wanted to make money. and He, he, gave, he wanted to pay Peter and John, to, so that they may give him power, so that he may give people the Holy Spirit. But Peter rebuked him, and he received the rebuke. How about you? Do you handle? How do you handle rebuke? Do you get mad at the person who is who is rebuking you? Can you accept criticism? Now, I'm not saying that uh, you should be browbeaten. I'm not saying people should yell at you like a drill sergeant. Because I believe criticism, rebuke, and reproof should all be done correctly. Even a secular world understands this. Now, someone here put together a, a table. Uh, I don't know if you guys can, can see it. I don't know if you can see it on the thing. Is that showing on the screen there? Mm -hmm. For those who are watching online. Constructive versus destructive criticism. I find this is neat. Uh, constructive criticism uh, should educate it's related to the work at hand. Uh, it helps build ideas. It makes the outcome better. It makes the person better. It's intelligent. There's reason behind your criticism. And its main objective is to help. But what does destructive criticism do? It embarrasses. You should never embarrass your children or anyone in front of anyone else. Even the Bible says, you want to rebuke an elder? Rebuke him in, in, in secret. Criticism should not feel like a personal attack. You should not be torn down when you're being uh, rebuked or reproved. 
were given reproof. And uh, many people, when they try to reprove you or rebuke you, they try to control you. That's not godly. That's not scriptural. When you rebuke someone, when you reprove someone, you have to do it with love. And if you don't love them, don't rebuke them. Don't reprove them. Because it'll be done in the wrong spirit. We are quick to point out those who, who can't take our criticism or rebuke. But how do you dish it out? How do you reprove someone? How do you rebuke someone? What is the spirit behind your nurture and admonition? And that's very hard for parents to do when they have children. Uh, the children need to know that you love them. Yeah, you're going to get angry at them. You're going to raise your voice at them. You'll get upset at them. But in the end, they need to know that you love them. They need to know that you have their best interests in mind. I tell my children, uh, I want you to become productive members of society. And I'm teaching them, oh, you're, you're, you're polluting your children's minds. I'm teaching them that life is not fair. If, you live, if you've worked or lived in the real world, you'll quickly find out life is not fair. But you have to be able to take it and keep going on. You can't let the reality of life destroy you. And I want to mention briefly the fear of the Lord. Uh, we, we looked at this in great length in Lesson 2 of our study. So uh, it's mentioned here in our, in our passage we just read in chapter 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding, is what we are told in this verse. The fear of the Lord occurs 14 times in the book of Proverbs. I want to I wanna encourage you as we're coming to an end. Unless you first fear the Lord, you will not be on the road to wisdom. Unless you desire holiness, you will not receive understanding. Uh, go back to this lesson as we gave an example, uh, examples, a series of examples of Christians uh, who lack understanding. Uh, indications of, of, of why you may lack understanding. And one of the things I've always believed, your, your Bible study, your, your biblical knowledge, your understanding of doctrine should always be coupled with holiness. I believe that, because that's the only way you can have a clean heart, a pure heart before God. As you seek the truth, God will look at your heart. I was uh, talking to a friend uh, earlier today, and I was telling him, you know what, you know what the, we see, we, we were talking about conspiracy theories about this coronavirus, and I, I'm a, I have a bent towards that, and, and wanting to know about conspiracy theories, but I told him, you know what my biggest problem is? my own heart. I battle my heart. Because the Bible tells me my heart is deceitful. My heart is wicked above all things. Deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. And I don't want my heart to lead me astray. So knowing that wisdom tells me, God tells you that your own heart can deceive you. Knowing that, what do I do? Then I go to my God and say, Oh Lord God, search me, O God. Search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in my heart. That's wisdom. And understanding tells me that if God knows what's in my heart, then who can help me with the issues and the problems of my heart? It's God. And if I know that, then I go to God and ask Him to help me with that. And from this, les from this lesson, wisdom and understanding are obtained in the following ways. First, you have to fear the Lord. You have to accept the invitation to wisdom's feast. I would accept any invitation to any feast that serves me. Receive wisdom's, it's a little jest here. I'm just being a little, try to be funny every once in a while. Uh, receive wisdom's instruction. Be a just man, live right. Pursue holiness and remain in wisdom. I want, to I want to end this lesson by reading two verses from Daniel chapter 12. And, and the angel tells Daniel and he says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So remain wise. Remain in wisdom. Remain in the Word of God. 
and God will make sure that you end up okay. Next week, we will uh, try to finish chapter 9, and uh, hope you stay uh, safe, stay coronavirus-free, and we'll see, see you here same time, same place next week.